3 o'clock. 3 o'clock is uh, Sean and JC.
Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine as well. Again, Father in heaven, we approach your throne of mercy from, from whence came the forgiveness that we have received. Remembering that we've stained our souls with sin and it took the blood of a sinless lamb, your son Jesus, to cleanse us, to wash us, to restore a relationship with you that we could never restore ourselves, Father. We remember the cost of our redemption as we drink this fruit of the vine, which brings the shed blood of your son Jesus to our mind. Help us to do this in a manner that is pleasing to you as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's another command that we've been given to observe upon the first day of the week, and that is to consider the prosperity that God has given us and determine to take a portion of that and return it to him that the work that he would have done here in Parker and throughout the world may be supplied. Again, it's good to count our blessings, isn't it? Because it makes us consider how well we are blessed and how incumbent upon us, on us it is to return a portion to God who gave it to us in the beginning. There is a box in the back for your collection to be dropped at the conclusion of services if you have not done so already. But at this time, let us offer a, a prayer of thanksgiving as we make that contribution. Our Father in heaven, not only did you send your son to save us from sins, Father, but you've given us all the things needed in this life to sustain our souls and our bodies. Food and shelter, clothing, the, the provision of everything that these bodies need, Father. There's nothing we can point to that say our hands have produced this or our minds have acquired it. Father, they're all blessings given to you, placed into our hands, and we acknowledge you as the source of all of our gifts. We pray that you'll receive that which we've determined to return to you, that it will be used to supply your kingdom and nothing will be lacking, and that you'll be with them who oversee the use of these funds. We pray this in Jesus' name. We're going to sing the song, Blessed Be the Lord God Almighty. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty works. And blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty works. And blessed be the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. We're going to sing one more song, I Have Found a Friend in Jesus. Following this song, we will have our scripture reading and then our sermon this morning. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. 
O he all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Today's scripture reading is from Ephesians verses uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all.
In Ephesians chapter 4, turn to verse 1 there. I've just uh, read there. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, urge you, beseech you, beg you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the body of peace. So this is what we need to, these are the things, the qualities in which, in which we need to acquire. These are the qualities in which we need to practice. This enables us then to uh, um, uh, preserve the unity that is found there. And then he goes into what this unity involves or what, it, what, is, what is with this unity, what it is uh, also uh, impacted by this unity. What are, if some have said, the facts of unity. You look at verse 4 and it says, there is one body. All right, well, if we were to just come to this passage and look at this verse and, and see it for the first time, we might ask yourself, well, what does that mean? There is, there, is one, there is one body, okay? Is, I mean, is it a physical body? Is it some spiritual body? What is it exactly that he's talking about? Well, let's go back and look at a couple of places here within Ephesians. And so turn with me to chapter 1. Chapter 1. <clears throat> and let's start uh, with verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18. I, this is Paul, says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power. He's speaking about Christ toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him, that is Christ from the dead, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. And so God, after uh, Christ was raised from the dead, sat him in a prominent, prestigious place at the right, his right hand, uh, indicating power and honor and authority. Verse 21, he says, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. He's just talking about the supremacy of Christ here. Not only in this age, but also the one to come. Now verse 22, notice what verse 22 says. And he, God, put all things in subjection under his feet, Christ, and gave Christ as head over all things to the church. The church, the people that are also translated the assembly. This is the people of God. Verse 23, it says, which is his, what? It's our word there. His body, the fullness of him, who fills all and in all. And so now we have a little bit here, an insight into the identity of what he says the one body here is in verse 4. Just by allowing the context, and let this a letter to the to church at Ephesus, to kind of explain it to us. We want to, as students of the Bible, we want to be diligent that when we come to a verse that we don't quite have the definitions for, that we might have a, an inkling of what it means, to not just go with what we think it is, but try to allow the Bible, and specifically in this letter to the Ephesians, let the letter tell us what it is. Let, let the context kind of explain further what it is. And so what do we learn here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22? And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head, he's speaking Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body which is his body. So now when we look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we see verse 4, there is one body. Well, as we talked about a little bit last week, but it wasn't our focus, if there is one body, and Paul says this is the one assembly, or this is the one gathering of God, this is the one church. There is one church. And so let's look a little bit more and discuss what else Ephesians tells us about this body. So look at then uh, chapter 2. And let's start in verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 14. Now I'll give you a little bit of background here. The church or the, the, the church in which Paul is writing to this, the body in which Paul is writing to this, are those the saints that are gathered in Ephesus. They're gathered in the city of Ephesus. And there's different people from different backgrounds who have become a part of this body, who have become a part of this 
church. Specifically, you have Jews and Gentiles. You have Jews who are the people of God, and you have Gentiles who are outside the understanding of God, who come from different backgrounds. And so Paul is saying here, you guys have come together. And notice what he's talking about here. Look at verse 14. Paul says, For he himself, Christ, is our peace, who made both groups, that is Jew and Gentile, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Notice the use of the word one that we see there back in Ephesians chapter 4. So this group has become one, the two groups have become one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments. That is basically he's talking about the Ten Commandments and the law of Moses was given to the Jews specifically. And so there was this strife between the Jews and other people, this thing that was separating them now, which was just given to, uh, just given to the Jews. But... <clears throat> Christ's work on the cross, that is the flesh that you see there in verse 15, his work on the cross enabled then that all might be able to come together. So then look at verse 16. Uh, let me look at verse 15 again. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances so that in himself, Jesus, he might make the two groups, that is Jew and Gentile, into one new man. One new man, thus establishing peace. Now look at verse 16. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. That is that they can come together into one body, as we've already seen in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, which is what? Which is the church. Which is the people of God coming together. And so... The cross enables people from all different backgrounds, all different races, all different upbringings to be able to come together to be one new person, one new body as Christ as the head. And so Paul is trying to paint this, this picture of the spiritual body using the physical body, using that word body for people to understand. We see that he does this in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, where he talks about the different parts of the body. And he talks about the eyes, and he talks about the ears, he talks about the hand, and he talks about the feet. And he talks about the importance of all those things and how they work. Then, as we identify who the body is, as we see the body is these people who are found themselves in Christ, they are in Christ, and if they are in Christ, they are in the body, and if they are in the body, then they are in his church. And Jesus is the head. And so as we look at try to understand then to identify, and I know that there are some other things that indicate the identification of the body, but looking here at Ephesians, we understand that there is one body that Paul talks about, and he goes, and earlier he explains that that is the one gathering of God. And so that's why, again, for context, it's extremely important that we understand then the work that is needed, the diligence that is needed to preserve the unity that we've been given in the one body or given in the one church. That's why it takes humility. That's why it takes gentleness. But see, when we get in a little bit too then to uh, the function of the church, the function of the body. You know, we're trying to get our kids to understand what the function of these things and how they interact. You know, uh, <clears throat> turn with me to, to Romans. Uh, show your, uh, keep your place there in Ephesians. And turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I've mentioned this before uh, in past lessons and, uh, with this in idea, with this uh, mind, uh, this idea in mind, that the unity, the diligence that it took, the humility that it took, the gentleness that, that, that it took, the, and the reminders of these things in order for them to happen was not just a problem in Ephesus. It was not just a problem in Philippi. It was not just a problem in Corinth. It was not just a problem in Rome. It is a problem that we often have with one another that when we get a 
a group, a, a you know, number of people together, there's bound to be some differences. There's bound to be some different backgrounds. And we've got to figure out how to work these things out together underneath the truths that we've been given in order to preserve the unity. But I want to look, I want us to look at a familiar couple of verses that we look at that we've probably heard preached. I've preached from these verses. But I want us to notice something that maybe we hadn't noticed before. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we look at these verses, and we oftentimes stop at verses 1 and 2, right? And sometimes it can be difficult to kind of wrap our minds around verses 1 and 2. But verses 1, we talk about, okay, it takes great sacrifice. I, I, I want to be a sacrifice to God. I want to, I want to have a spiritual service and sacrifice to God, and I want to be able to do that daily. And so part of how I do that daily is do not be conformed to this world. unless, and In other words, don't let this world decide the direction in which you are going to go. Don't let this world choose what is best or right for you, but rather be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind. And the idea there is God can then transform you. You can be transformed by what you're learning from God. The love that he has, the peace that he's offered, the justice that he brings, the grace that he wants to give us, the mercy that we need so much of. So we're like, okay, I don't be, don't be conformed to this world. Okay, James, uh, be transformed by the renewing. You might be, be diligent to read and study God's word. But then we kind of like, well, what does that look like? And then, we, then this, is, this is the point, I think, sometimes where we go, well, you know, it could, you know, it could be a work. Uh, you know, where I, I don't want to be conformed to some of the people and co-workers that are there. Maybe they're, they're uh, trying to get me to think one way or one way or the other or, or social media or whatever it might be. And those things are, are good uh, in principle to, to uh, apply to our lives. But remember, be careful about what you start to try to think it might be. Stop and read on. So let's read on in verse 3. All right, let's read on in verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Oh, okay, well, that might take some sacrifice, right? All right, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Well, that, that might take some transformation, that might take some transformation that is needed through God's word. But notice how it continues on. For just as we have many members in... Oh, what? We have many members in one... What is he talking about now here? We just read from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, that the body is what? The church. The assembly. Colossians 1, 18 and verse 24 also talk to the same thing. The body which is the church. Now, it's not to say that our daily sacrifice, you know, in, in, is our worship to God. We're going to sacrifice ourselves to give and worship to God. But Paul goes on to explain what this means a little bit more. And I think that we forget about this application. So let's continue to read in, a, in a Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. They don't have the same function. You know, our, our children... Hey, kids, can you look up there and you see that the hand doesn't necessarily do what the mouth does, although that's what happens when you're a baby, right? But then you have a nose, you have eyes, you have ears. Those all do different things, right? Eli, those do all different things. Those all do different things. And, and so each as the members of the body have different functions in which they operate within this body, within this church. But it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take transformation on our part to where what we did know and what we've what we've learned you know as as children as we grow up as as babies especially small ones they don't quite understand exactly uh selflessness 
That's a concept that they can't grasp at all or even is a concept in their mind. Uh, they need to be fed. Uh, they, want, they want warmth. They want to be comforted. Uh, they, they need sleep. They're going to need those diapers changed. And so and as they're growing, they're understanding certain cues to give to us in order to get those, receive those things in which they need. And so as we're growing, though, we learn this understanding, okay, well, the world doesn't revolve around me as a baby. I've got to learn some different things. I've got to learn some different things in which to function. So you look at Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Again, verse 4, for the, just as we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one another. He's talking about individual people here. We who are many are one body, one function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. In prophecy, speaking according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, or he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who serve, shows mercy with cheerfulness. And then notice what he goes on to say here in verse 9. And notice who he's talking about again. He continues to talk about let love be without hypocrisy, that agape love, that, that, that unconditional love, that active love, not the emotional love. Doing what is right for one another. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, preserving in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. And so now we're getting into the function of the, the body. We've identified that the body is his church, that it is, is his people. Not right now, but later on we're going to get into that entry into, because we're going to look at each one of these one, these unities, things that we find here in 4 through 6. But we need to identify the body, and we know that that is Christ's church, which he is head. And if he is head, then he is able, or has the authority then, as we see he's been given all rule and authority, to say, hey, here's how I want you to act. Here's how I want you to behave. And here's how I want you to function. Your function, a lot, a lot of the function, not the only function, but a big part of the function is with one another. So one of the, you know, other things that's neat to play with young ones, you know, you, you do this one, where's your nose, you know, where's your eyes, where's your ears, and you go, okay, where's mama? You know, and, and they look up, you know, and, and they, they, some of them are you're not quite yet ready for point, but they just know and they look over and they see mommy over there. They're like, yeah, that's right. Where's daddy? You know, and you're looking around, oh, there's daddy. You know, where's Uncle James? <laughs> oh, I'm over here. I'm over. She, she, she knows, she knows me. I, I just used that for illustration. Uh, she looks, you know, amazing. My niece looks over and she sees me, you know, and she smiles. I'm like, there's recognition. Right? Because you want them to recognize who's part of the family, right? Who's part of the family in which she's been blessed into, just as we've been blessed to that physical family. And so you're trying to identify, now you have identified kind of the family, but you want to identify individuals within it. Who are these people? And so the more times that you are around that young child, guess what's going to happen? The more that they're going to be able to recognize who you are. You know, you, you, you might want to be in a child's life. You might want to be there. And when they go, okay, who's Uncle James? And they know, they're like, I don't know. They know how to do this already. You know, they, they, I, don't, I don't know who that is. And you're like, oh, it's me. It's right here. But if I'm not around that child, whose fault is that? Well, the child, you can't blame the small child for not recognizing who I am. I've got to be around that child. How, how are we supposed to practice humility? How are we supposed to practice gentleness? How are we supposed to practice our diligence? 
How are we supposed to practice these things that we are to give to one another if we're not around one another? We dismiss the function that is entailed in the church. And I'm not talking about just Sunday morning in this building. I'm talking about in our lives. We won't be able, we can't, we can't recognize one another because we're not around each other. We don't know, hey, are you the mouth? No, you don't talk a whole lot. Maybe you're the ears. Wow, you're a great listener. But we don't know the function of, of the, all these parts because if we're not together, we can't figure out and identify them. Just as Christ is the head and the body and the body moves with Christ and the body moves together, we too as individual members need to move together. And the way we move together is if we are with one another because then we can practice these things. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we look back at, at, at Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity. You're like, I don't have any beefs with anybody. You know, I, I, I love everybody. Have you been hanging around all of them? Because if you really hang out with people, you know, there's going to be some times, as we talked about it, where you're going to have to practice that patience. And you're going to have to practice that, that peace and that, that tolerance and love for the quirkiness. But if you don't ever get to that point, you're not preserving anything. Because you haven't experienced it yet. So it takes identification, but also not only of the body, the church, Christ's church, but also then the function that happens within the church and the work that happens with one another. So each, just as these parts that we have know, as we've come to know, function with one another and you can't do with one without the other, same with the church. We can't function without one another. We can't. We can't function without one another. As a church, we need all these parts to work together. We need to work on our humility around being with one another. As we talked about in Philippians chapter 2, we need to work on putting others first in our lives, considering others more important than ourselves. But we can't do that unless we work on being together, sharing life. Because that's what God wants us to do is share life in this body that we belong to. I appreciate the Allisons starting up uh, the young families. Uh, my question is, okay, I've got a young adult, I've got a youth, and then I've got a little guy. It's not so little anymore. <laughs> so I'm in all part, I mean, can I even be at that young family thing? That's the question. It's like, if you, if you have little guys, well, I've got big guys too, so how does that work? Well, I'm going to be there anyway, probably, whether you like it or not. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of thing, it, and you know what? It's simple. It's simple. Let's order some pizza, come over to my house, let's hang out. It's simple. I think sometimes we get stuck on... on um, pomp and circumstance and, and everything just being right and my house is this and my house is not this and this is not this and there's nothing in here that says if your house is too small you can't have anybody over if you didn't finish the laundry don't invite anybody over the function of these things it's a necessity in physical life and it's a necessity in the spiritual life we have to work on these things. Let's start. I also, with JC and Shauna, bringing uh, the young uh, ladies and, and women, every, all the women are invited. Uh, they just wanted to know that, that was, it's geared towards the younger generation. But that doesn't mean that the older generation can't be a part of that and, and inspire and bring wisdom and, and counsel and example. 
But it's, it's things like that that make this body function the way that Christ wants it to function. And then we can practice the things that God says to practice because we are actually with one another. There's one body, and we are blessed to be a part of it. Let's identify the parts that we have in here and start working together rather than separately. As we'll talk about down the weeks in a couple of weeks as we work through these one body, one Lord, one faith, one God, one spirit, uh, one baptism, uh, we'll look at each of these individual to, to show the importance and, and how they're also explained here uh, a little bit in Ephesians. Uh, one of the things here, though, that, that we want to understand is, uh, as we're talking about this morning, um, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says to Peter, he asks Peter, he says, Peter, who do they... Who do they say that I am? And Peter says, well, some say uh, Elijah, some say, uh, some say a prophet. Um, and then Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, you are the Christ. You are the son of God. And Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my body, my church, my assembling of God's people. I will build that. And the rock in which he is speaking about is the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Identifying who Jesus is enables us then to identify who the body is. And that is the body of Christ, his body. And then we see in places like 1 Corinthians. So we need, we need to understand that, that that foundational understanding of who Jesus is, we need to know and have that in order to then begin to work towards having a relationship with God. And then understanding the son of Jesus as the Son of God, we understand his sacrifice and what he did, and then why he did it, and that he did it for us. And then we understand that he did that for us, then we realize we don't want to be conformed to this world anymore. We want to be transformed. We want to have peace in our mind through God, peace with others around us in Christ. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, you, you were baptized into or immersed into one body. You were all immersed into one body. And so we'll look at that, uh, that entry point, if you will, later on. But if you've not been immersed yet, as Paul says in Romans chapter 6, as Peter says in Acts chapter 2, then you are not in his body as he has explained. So if that's not something you've heard before, ask some questions after. Talk to me, uh, talk to, to Britton, Steve that got up and led singing, um, uh, John that got up and, and, and read some of uh, the scripture this morning. Talk to some of those people this morning and let's sit down and, and answer some of those questions so that you can understand the peace that you can have in Christ and then also that you are identified and precious in Christ and are an important part of this body. Let us stand and let us sing. I have a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land. I am on my way to those mansions there, just over in the glory to sing God's praise and His glory share, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory land, just over Just over in the glory land. What a 
joyful thought that my Lord I'll see just over in the glory land and with kindred saints there forever be just over in the glory land just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land. With the blood-washed throng I will shout and sing, just over in the glory land, glad hosannas to the Lord and King, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory land, just Just over in the glory land. Please remain standing for our closing prayer. Just a couple of things I'd like to uh, uh, include in the announcements that we had this morning. One is uh, the teens had a work service project this last week. And you can see some of their uh, great work up here on the front wall. But they took out hundreds of staples uh, that we used to put up all of our VBS stuff. If you were here during that time, uh, it goes from the, the baptistry all the way back there, downstairs, through every room, in the fellowship room. You can just imagine. They painted down there, they painted up here, got the colors wrong. We're going to have to have Bruce and Glenda Beasley come back uh, to take care of that for us, but we sure appreciate what y'all did and the hard work you did, not only here, but throughout the metro community, and you're to be commended for that. Also, uh, if you would, if you haven't already, fill out a card. Ryan, I got yours right here. So. If you're visiting with us, uh, John, make sure you fill one out, or I'll be calling James. Okay? You guys uh, fill out a card if you're visiting with us. We'd just like to send you a, a card to thank you for uh, gracing us with your presence. We're happy that you're here. Um, on behalf of the elders, um, Daryl and Kirk are out traveling, and we have many who are traveling. We have many here that have traveled uh, that are visiting with us today as uh, the whole COVID thing continues into 2021. A lot of people are getting out now and we're so thankful that you were with us today. Uh, if I forgot something, forgive me, but uh, thank you again for being here. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this our Lord's Day where we're able to come together and praise you and sing songs of praise, encouraging one another to hear uh, James speak from your word today, your truth and uh, remind us of uh, what this body is to us and how we should behave and how we should act with one another. Father, help us to always put the interest of others before ourself. Help us to remain humble, uh, to be encouraging to one another. Father, as we go out into the world this week, we ask that you would help us to be um, 
the light uh, to your son and his truth, what he did for us. Help us to look for those windows of opportunity that you give us every day to share the good news. Father, forgive us when we fall short. We all sin and fall short of your glory. But thanks be to God you sent your son so that we could have forgiveness of those sins that we sometimes struggle with in our life. Help us, Father, to walk in your righteousness and be an example to those around us. Be with us as we leave here today. Be with those who are traveling. Be with those who could not be with us today and are at home. Um, help them to know that we miss them and help us to reach out to them to let them know how much we love them. And it's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.